At Oracle Open World 2012, this is SiliconAngle.com's The Cube. The Cube is our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. Uh, we go to all the events we possibly can, and where the action is, we are there. SiliconAngle and Wikibon are on the ground providing great coverage, blanket coverage, and breaking analysis. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and it's our pleasure to introduce you to Lee Doyle, uh, first time Cube guest, a friend of mine, worked with Lee many, many years. Lee, welcome to theCUBE. Great, thanks Dave. Great to see you. Um, yeah, so Pleasure Lee and I, here. we worked together, God, I think we started in the same week at IDC back in the early 1980s. And, uh, Is it that long so ago? We don't look that old. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, so Lee, you know a lot of people in this business. You've seen some major changes um, over the years and the hot thing now is, is software-defined networking. Right. So, so help us squint through that. Is it, you know, what's real, what's hype, what does it all mean? Um, that's a great question. It is the hottest thing going on in networking these days, for sure. And it is real, and it's going to be a change in, in how networks are architected and how, the, how agile they are and how they're managed and uh, how you architect uh, for the cloud. So what does it all mean, uh, software-defined networking? How do you define that? So it's really the ability to abstract the intelligence and separate some of the hardware from the software or the control from the data plane is the classic definition. But you know, a more real definition to me is ho having open APIs and having an open ecosystem around the network as opposed to uh, simply being this closed black box where you optimize software for ASIC performance. So networking is an interesting industry from the standpoint of Cisco has dominated for such a long time. I don't know what its market share is. And but it still is. Well over half, right? It's I mean, it's two thirds, you know. So, so is this trend, this software-defined networking trend, is it disruptive to Cisco? Is it going to allow others to, to gain share, or is it more evolutionary and Cisco will just continue to dominate in your view? Uh, I can go a little bit in both, but it is, it is potentially disruptive because it does offer uh, a new way of doing things and those who are more nimble and who can uh, move faster and you know, the incumbents always tend to move a little slower in, the, in these markets. So, um, what's your take on um, Oracle Open World, I mean, is this, is, is this a show you've gone to you know, frequently? And you know, Oracle's not really a networking company, right. per se, but uh, so what brings you here and you know, what's your angle on Oracle? Well, I've, I've traditionally worked with Oracle on the telecom um, business and so they sell a lot of uh, servers and, and other things to the telecom industry. Uh, but also networking's a big part of the cloud story these days and so I expect Oracle to uh, embrace software-defined networking at least uh, in part well, that's their MO. They tend to go after the trends that kind of percolate and kind of cross the chasm and then put their, their blanket around it and bring it in, wrap it into the fold uh, and vertically integrate that right. to Larry to get his data center future. Uh, it's no secret in the industry for folks who have been in the industry as long as us and you've been covering the sector. I mean, Larry wants his own data center. He's always right. dreamed of you know, being HP. He's had HP Envy for years, back in the day when HP actually was envious, um, in terms of like the Bill and Dave days, but now with HP struggling, he's also got Mark Hurd on the team. Um, he could get there, I mean, he's got the package. So how do you, as an analyst, look at that and say, okay, um, we got to get some networking in there, but hey, Larry, you got a multi-vendor situation going on. It's been going on for the history of the tech business. This is not a, this is not a pure play consumer clean sheet of paper. You got legacy, you got multi-vendor, you got interoperability. Um, that always comes around in every cycle, it always comes back, interoperability. What's your take on that and how does Oracle need to deal with that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's clearly the ability to buy a company. There's lots of startups and uh, VMware has uh, taken its plunge with 1.2 billion with Nacera. Uh, there's the partnership route and there's also open, uh, you know, open source or an open community around OpenFlow, so there's a way to, to play it uh, all of those different ways for Oracle, depends on what they want to do. What about um, the confusion in the market? Obviously, the Nasira deal pops everyone up and say, hey, you know, something going this down here. This is important, yeah. Wow, I mean, big <laughs> step up from valuation when they just did their last venture round, now it's a billion dollars, and so everyone's kind of high-fiving each other in Silicon Valley, but it puts everyone on notice. So at VMworld, when we had theCUBE there, we noticed uh, an air of a cold war. We called it the Cuban Missile Crisis of Cloud, where Cisco steps back, they got this weird press release with VMware, you got Juniper kind of going, wait a minute, we did Junos, uh, and you got OpenFlow startups. So you got this like balancing, kind of a retweaking of everyone, kind of a reset. Right. Um, explain that to folks out there. One, is that real, or is that just more a facade of the dynamic? Uh, and what are the big postures of the big vendors? What are they doing what, at post-Nasir acquisition? What are they thinking? Right, well I, I see three categories of uh, players. So there's the startups, 
There's Nacera, now uh, VMware. Um, there's Big Switch, there's Embrain, there's a lot of other uh, guys announced and unannounced in the Valley. So there's a ton of money there. There's the networking guys and they all have a transitional story. You know, buy our stuff and we'll take you to the SDN vision. That includes Cisco, that includes Juniper, that includes Brocade. And then you have the IT players, uh, which would include VMware, but also HP, IBM, um, Dell, and others who need to have a full Oracle perhaps, who need to have a full stack. So if it's, if it's software defined data center or however you'd like to define the next generation cloud build, networking has to be part of it. Yeah, we, we gave you a little peek of our software led infrastructure positioning we're coming out with because um, that's undefined. So software defined data center really means nothing right now. Which is good, that's a marketing dream. So, you know, uh, marketing guys out there are scrambling, put stakes in the ground. But the geeks call it network virtualization. The market calls it software-defined networking. Right. So, connect the dots. Where is those net next journey? What happens between network virtualization, software-defined networks, and then the destination of uh, software-defined data center? Is well, it the I mean, same thing? Is there tweaks to the story? Well, SDN is really about helping the network keep up with the migration and, and the tremendous innovation that's happened in servers for sure and then storage to uh, maybe a slightly slower uh, extent. So you need to provision uh, virtual machines, you know, to move them, you need to do so securely and you need to do so in a, in a very high performance way. So that's what software defined networking is primarily about. It's about uh, public cloud builds, then private clouds, and then we can talk about campus and branch and WAN and all sorts of, of other uh, things when we get there. So I wonder if you could um, put your practitioner hat on for a second and talk to the users in our, in our audience. What does all this change mean to the, to the user organizations out there? Right. What should they be thinking? Right. Well, you know, if you're looking at the uh, cloud holistically, let's say it's private cloud, uh, moving to a more agile data center, right? You've got a number of different parts in that. In your networking part, you need to look at what are the APIs, what are the ecosystems, what are the tools and some of the software that you can use to leverage software-defined networking? Because networking without tools, without something to leverage it, it's just, it's more networks. Uh, you need to look at management and provisioning. Ideally, you want to reduce OPEX. The manual config configuring of the network is just very time consuming and, and very costly in, in people terms. Security is a big issue. Also, from a legacy standpoint, everything is, you have to migrate from, unless you're, unless you're starting over, unless you're blown up or going completely greenfield, you, have, you start with switches and routers and, and go from there. And the plumbing's not going away, so you want to have a high performing, uh, resilient network architecture as well. Lee, what's your take on the, uh, the whole service provider trend? It's interesting, you, you go to most of these events, and I mean, certainly at VMworld, you heard a lot of focus on service providers. We were at EMC World, we were at SAP Sapphire. There's a real discourse from the host vendor to really try to court these big service providers. Um, you haven't heard a lot here from, from Oracle. Now maybe right. they're selling you know, technology in there, but Certainly not from a partner standpoint. We're not hearing, oh, we're going to partner up with the service providers and deliver clouds and they're going to buy our technology. Um, what's your, for two questions here. What's your take on the whole service provider trend? Is it disruptive? Is it a new form of distribution channel? Is it just you know, the evolution of the services business? And what's your take on Oracle's angle with service providers? Well, I think it, it, it depends on how you define service provider, right? Being you know, a networking and telecom guy, when I think of service provider, you know, I think of AT&T or Verizon, sure. right. but you could also think of Google and Amazon right. and Rackspace and a whole lot of other uh, folks. So clearly there's a whole lot of servers going and, ser and storage going into these organizations. So they are a new channel. So they're a buyer. And they, yeah, yeah. Huge, a huge buyer, right? And the traditional telecom companies really need to uh, change their business model and are changing their business model to be full-scale cloud providers, especially the, the tier one uh, folks. How about we were, we were talking uh, off camera about Dell a little bit. You know, they've really stepped it up in a, in, in a number of enterprise businesses, right. certainly storage. Uh, they've always sort of been in the server space with the x86 uh, servers, but also networking. They've made some right. acquisitions there. What's your angle on, on Dell's networking strategy? 
Well, networking and security. So they bought a, a number of companies uh, yep. in that space, and they're they're trying to put that together with their server and storage to really go to mid, you know, traditionally mid-tier enterprise, right? Is the Dell. Uh, right. story, so they're trying to package that all together and leverage that into a consistent, um, you know, integrated offer. Do you consider them a, a, a major player in the space that you follow, Dell? Uh, I think, that, you know, they're a player in the networking area, you know, are they going to go after, you know, the big public cloud? Bill, you know, I don't know, that's... Yeah. Lee, talk about HP, because we're bullish on HP, we've been, you know, critical of HP, I have been, in, and then taking some heat for that um, with HP, but not the audience. Because <laughs> uh, um, I love HP. I've been, you know, worked there nine years myself. I've, folks know that. I've been very transparent about that. But their networking group's solid. I mean, they've had right. a great legacy in networking, going back to the Ether Switch days back in you know back in the '90s, uh, and then they bought 3Com most recently. Yep. They're just solid on networking. They've been shipping an open flow product. Bethany Mayer was on the Cube talking about that, and they're not pumping it up. So they can be, they got some work on marketing. Mike Bannock's and others got to do do some marketing on that. But for the most part, they're solid. They're part of that ESSN group now called Enterprise. So they've been uh, executing converged infrastructure, um, pretty in a cool way before anyone else really is trying to go in there. Right. What's their current situation right now? Are they just not getting the word out? Um, is it, are they being smothered by the HP kind of reboot? Um, and, and what's their prospect? Give us, a, give us your take on HP at the sure, moment. Sure, I'd love to. Um, you know, they're the number two networking vendor behind Cisco, so um, they're have been growing in, in networking. So they're, you know, they're a solid player. Have quite a, a broad product line, and, and uh, people respect their their products. I think they do suffer a little bit of the uh, HP hangover from the from the corporate side, but they've been busy getting the, the message out and, and putting together a data center story uh, that leverages the network. They have a good story? They do, yeah. How, so, how so about the servers? You follow the servers at all with that group? Or? Um, not, you know, I'm more a networking guy. Well, what about the converged infrastructure play? I mean, right. that obviously affects networking. Um, it's kind of an evolutionary trend, um, but, um, but, but people are using that as a wedge, as a way to compete in the marketplace. Clearly Cisco, getting into right. the server business, was, looked like it was going to be disruptive, but it seems like it's more just an evolution now. Um, have you tracked that, that market and, and what's your take on it? Right, you know, everyone's trying to put together server storage networking with the management wrapper and mm. make it a lot easier. I think um, HP has, has done some really interesting things there, as has IBM, as has Cisco. So, um, you know, there's a lot going on. I don't, think, I don't think it's all been played out yet. Are IT organizations ready for that convergence? Are they organizationally aligned for that? Right, they're thinking about it, but are they there yet? Probably not. We had Jay Shree, the uh, CEO of Arista yep. on the Cube many times. She's a dynamo, we love her, a big fan of her work, and also she's great on the Cube. She gives great, great content on the Cube. Um, but Arista, they got funded, they got in the trenches when there wasn't a lot of funding and it wasn't cool to be a networking player. And you know, right. we've talked to Doug Gourlay many times, he's a friend, he's been at ex-Cisco. It's hard to build a systems company. And I talked to the founder of uh, uh, Pradeep, founder of Juniper. You know, doing a networking startup wasn't like it used to be. It's really hard, it costs a lot of money. So Arista did it when it wasn't sexy, and now SDN hits the table, and they're kind of clawing, hey, hey, we're here. So, and they have a good product. I see their boxes in right. all the top data centers of the web scale companies. What's your take on Arista? I'm relative to one, their, their current situation, and then now the market's spinning with SDN. Well, I want to, to, to comment on your startup question. So software-defined networking, you need tens of millions of dollars, maybe even a couple million dollars to start up, as opposed to you know, Arista and Juniper, they need hundreds of millions to build the ASICs, right? So order of magnitude, so there's going to be a lot more software. This is not a super angel deal. Right. This is not any micro VC, 500K, right. put up a no, website. No, Arista you know, built, has built some very high performance networking. They've got a niche, especially at the, at the high end, and they're now starting to tell uh, their software defined networking story, and Jay Cherie's done a nice job of so, some of the comments I've seen there. So you talked about you know, building ASICs and some of the custom silicon, um, yet we are living in this world, everybody says it's going to commodity. Right. Software defined implies you know, right. commoditization. We had Jay Shri on, one of the first things out of her mouth was software de defined, and she's very savvy, taking advantage of those trends, but what's your take on that? Are we moving toward a more, you know, a less custom ASIC world, or is there a more of a demand for that type of capability right. because of the networking bottlenecks that we're seeing? I don't think, software defined networking doesn't presuppose commodity. 
it's an option, right? Um, there's always going to be plumbing, and plumbing, it, they're always going to need high performance plumbing, and high performance plumbing is going to require ASICs. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, where's the balance of intelligence? Where's the commoditization? Is there going to be more COTS? Is there going to be more off the shelf, uh, you know, x86 in networking over time? Absolutely. How fast and where? That's a great question and one that I've been looking at really closely. So we were talking about NYSERA and, and VMware before and Cisco. Of course, Cisco and EMC, John Chambers and Joe Tucci have this very tight relationship. VMware goes out and buys NYSERA. Everybody says, oh, that's the end of the relationship. And of course, they, in public, have a you know, great relationship. They're doing a lot of business together. But right. if you fast forward five, seven years, uh, you can see where a company like VMware will gain more networking function into the stack, try to commoditize the, the network where possible, because they want to keep, keep it as low cost as possible. But you, you're, I guess your argument is there's still room for guys like Arista and Juniper for the highest performance applications and use cases to tuck in there, but what's your take on, on that whole trend? Right, well, you still need the network to move the bits, right? It's what's controlling that operation and, and where's the value chain, where's the profit pools go, right? And is VMware and Cisco on a, a five-year collision? Absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about Oracle. So Larry Ellison <coughs> said in the keynote, small little comment, of course, we picked up on it because our name's Silicon Angle. He said, Silicon, we want to go to Silicon. So we all know the Apple move, right? And, and I know this because uh, a bunch of my friends were um, engineers for a bunch of startups that Apple ended up buying for the Silicon. Right. Apple made these moves early on, buying guys, building chips, proprietary chips, purpose-built for specific hardware functions. They have Sun. Larry's got to have his own chips. That's in the future. So where, does, where, would that, where would you see that fitting into them, obviously, uh, for this day? Any perspective there? We're trying to tease that out because no one really picked up on that yeah, well, comment. It, I mean, it's hard to even get a, it's hard to tease Sun out of Oracle these days, right? And, but it's still a very important part. In the sense it's, too, it's now fully in there? Well, also, just, you don't talk a lot about Spark, you don't hear a lot of talk about Spark, and, you know, um, but uh, is that because Oracle was a software company that bought them for a yard sale, uh, <laughs> uh, or and yeah. Larry's got his own little hardware group? I mean, I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions <laughs> I think there. I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, but Sun is a is a toy for Larry. He's building it. He's not he's not blowing off Sun. He's fully putting it in there. Right. I mean, that's a core part of his strategy. Right. Well, I mean, I think a really interesting aspect of this, and one of the things I'm here to learn about, is is how Oracle take its engineer systems approach and really builds that into the networking and telecom industry, because that's always an, an industry that has had very highly specialized hardware and highly specialized software and an optimized black box type function. You well, don't you don't just split it out. Right, and you're seeing some adoption of these converged infrastructure solutions within telecom, and in a way. Exadata was one of the first converged infrastructure solutions, although it's not a general purpose converged infrastructure solution. So right. Oracle, if I understand it, really doesn't have a, a, a clean product play there yet. I'm sure they have a lot of different products that, you know, Sun legacy products that they sell into telecom, because Sun had a huge telecom business. But what, what do you think the right move for Oracle is? Should they go, for instance, to go compete against the V-Block, for example, or some of these other reference architectures out there like like you're seeing with FlexPod at, at NetApp in the partnership with Cisco and VMware, or will Oracle, in your view, just take a typical Oracle different approach? Well, the, I'm going to take a slightly different angle on that question, which is uh, in a little notice acquisition, they bought a company called GoHead. So GoHead does uh, HA middleware, uh, which is uh, SAF compliance, which is a, a technical way of talking about telecom specific um, middleware, and so they're going to bundle that in with their engineered systems, and and you know really try to offer a platform for both service providers and network equipment companies to build their specific applications on top and then of that. And we were talking off camera as well. Oracle bought Zygo, and they made it a, they marketed it as a software-defined networking play. It's really an I/O virtualization play, you know, a form of consolidation virtualization. It's like Oracle's picking off these little pieces, and then they end up putting them together and. Next thing you know, they announce the Oracle Public Cloud or the Oracle Private Cloud, and it's all red stack in there. It's a right. really different strategy than you see. It's very IBM-like of the 1980s, early 1990s, isn't it? 
Right, and, and they can clearly off, offer the, the full public cloud or private cloud stack to the telecom industry, and they clearly intend to. Right. How, um, how about mobile? We haven't talked anything about mobile, but, but have you been tracking mobile and, and, and its implications to the networking business, and what's your take on that? Sure, you know, BYOD, um, the wireless LAN, and once you have a network that is wireless led as opposed to wired, now you have a different architecture and you have potential disruption to, to go to a more software-defined uh, arena and to look at uh, what your incumbent is, you're, because the, the plumbing's still in the background, but you're not as concerned about the, the actual hardwire plug. BYOD, you know, that's a real challenge for a lot of IT. It's, it's, a, um, it's a management necessity, but how you implement it in a secure manner in a high-performance networking solution is not it, you know, intuitively obvious all the time. Well, yeah, you've got a lot of inertia with the legacy, you know, desktops and devices and processes, and all of a sudden you have to support these new devices. It's it's not trivial. And then, oh, by the way, you need to build an app store. Right. <laughs> I mean, we, we really have you know anywhere, uh, anytime, any device is upon us. We talked about it for a long time. Now it's here. All right, Lee Doyle, well listen, thanks very much for coming by theCUBE. Uh, as always, good to see you, good insights, and uh, love to have you back at some point. And um, enjoy the rest of the show, and thanks for watching everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest right after this. All right, man.